Welcome to the second episode of the Teaching with Purpose podcast in the series Cracking the Code. This particular podcast, the second episode, is called Political Will, Having Political Will. It's very important right now in its time and climate to have political will. You got to have the knowledge. You got to have the will to activate equity. Will, in a simple definition, is a mental focus that turns into a deliberate action. Being diligent, purposeful, and having a determined action. To bring about results and manifest whatever you need to manifest. And I think that's very important to have in this time. And, and, and especially if you, if you are in education, you got to have will. Especially if you want to move the dial for equity. We have a special guest today. We have Dr. Doris McEwen. She's going to talk about will. Talk about those variations of will. And talk about the importance of will. So I want you guys to have some listening ears and listen. Take notes. This podcast, again, is for students, parents, teachers, administrators, superintendents, board, school board members, whoever has an ear right now. I want you guys to take a listen to Dr. Doris McEwen. I didn't give you a lot about my background, but um, my first position was a teacher of English. And I've had administrative positions all the way up through superintendent and state and all of that other stuff. But my first love is teaching. So when I think about these concepts of the will, I'm going to explain each one of them to you, but I also want you to know that they interface. They're not uh, uh, going to be independent of each other. So when we think about social will, social will is the belief system. It means that we believe that every student in our care can and will be successful because we're going to design infrastructure, we're going to design an understanding of students, and we're going to have the courage. We're going to have the courage to act on their behalf. So social will, for me, goes back to Ron Edmonds. And some of you will know Ron Edmonds' work because he was the father of the effective schools movement. So Ron Edmonds said that we can, whenever and wherever we choose, teach all students whose schooling is of interest to us, that we already know more than we need to do that. And the fact that we haven't done so must finally rest on how we feel about the fact that we haven't done so. So we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we feel about the fact that we have students in our care who are not being successful in schools? And why is that? That's an intentional design in the system. And it's an intentional flaw in the system. So social will is about that belief in students. <clears throat> and I'm going to start social will by reading to you what's called Three Letters to Teddy. And some of you may have heard this before. But I want to read this into your hearing. It says, Teddy's letter came today. And now that I've read it, I will, play it, I will place it in my cedar chest with the other things that are important to me in my life starts off, I wanted you to be the first to know, and I smiled as I read the words he had written, and my heart swelled with a pride that I had no right to feel. I have not seen Teddy Stollard since he was a student in my fifth grade class 15 years ago. It was early in my career, and I had only been teaching for two years. From the first day he stepped into my classroom, I dislike Teddy. Teachers, although everyone knows differently, are not supposed to have favorites, but most especially they're not to show dislike for any child. Nevertheless, nevertheless, every year there are one or two children that one cannot help but be attached to, for teachers are human, and it is the human nature to like the bright, pretty, intelligent people, whether they are 10-year-olds or 25. And sometimes, not too often, fortunately, there will be one or two students to whom the teacher just can't seem to relate. I had thought myself quite capable of handling my personal feelings along that line until Teddy walked into my life. There wasn't a child I particularly liked that year, but Teddy was most assuredly one I disliked. He was dirty, not just occasionally, but all the time. His hair hung, flung, 
hung slow, low over his ears, and he actually had to hold it out of his eyes as, as he wrote his paper in class. And that was before it was fashionable to do so. Two, he had a peculiar odor about him that I could never quite identify. His physical faults were many, and his intellect left a lot to be desired. By the end of the first week, I knew he, had hope, he was hopelessly behind the others. Not only was he behind, he was just plain slow. I, be, I began to withdraw from him immediately. Any teacher will tell you that it is more of a pleasure to teach a bright child. It is definitely more rewarding for one's ego. But any teacher worth her credentials can channel work to the bright child keeping him challenged and learning while she puts her major efforts on the slower ones. Any teacher can do this, but most teachers do it. But I didn't, not that year. In fact, I concentrated on my best students and let the others follow along as best they could. Ashamed as I am to admit it, I took perverse pleasure in using my red pen. And each time I came to Teddy's paper, the cross marks, and there were many, were a bit larger and a little redder than necessary. Poor work, I would write with a flourish. While I did not actually ridicule the boy, my attitude was obviously quite apparent to the class, for he quickly became the class goat, the outcast, the unlovable, and the unloved. The days rolled by, and we made it through the fall festival, the Thanksgiving holidays, and I continued marking happily with my red pen. As the Christmas holidays approached, I knew that Teddy would never catch up, and he would not be promoted to sixth grade. He would be a repeater. To justify myself, I went to his cumulative folder from time to time. He had very low grades for the first four years but no grade failure. How had he made it? I didn't know. I closed my mind to the personal remarks. First grade, Teddy shows promise by work and attitude, but he had a poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. Mother terminally ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy is a pleasant boy, helpful but too serious, slow learner. Mother passed away at the end of the year. Fourth grade, very slow, but well behaved. Father shows no interest. Well, they passed him four times, but he will certainly repeat fifth grade. Do him good, I said to myself. And then the last day before the holiday arrived, our little tree on the reading table sported paper and popcorn chains. Many gifts were help <coughs> heaped underneath the tree, waiting for the big moment. Teachers always get several gifts at Christmas, but mine that year seemed bigger and more elaborate than ever. There was not a student who had not brought me one. Each unwrapping brought squills of delight, and the proud giver would receive effusive thank yous. Teddy's gift wasn't the last one I picked up. In fact, it was in the middle of the pile. Its wrapping was a brown paper bag and he had colored Christmas trees and red bells all over it. It was stuck together with masking tape. For Miss Jones, from Teddy, it read. The group was completely silent, and for the first time, I felt conspicuous, embarrassed, because they all stood watching me unwrap the gift. As I removed the last bit of masking tape, two items fell to my desk a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with several stones missing, and a small bottle of dime store cologne, half empty. I could hear the snickers and whispers, and I wasn't sure I could even look at Teddy. Isn't this lovely, I asked, placing the bracelet on my wrist. Teddy, would you help me fasten it? There was a few hesitant oohs and ahs, but as I dabbed the cologne behind my ears, all the little girls lined up for a dab behind their ears. I continued to open the gifts until I reached the bottom of the pile. We ate our refreshments and the bell rang. The children filed out and shouts of see you next year and Merry Christmas, but Teddy waited at his desk. 
When they all left, he walked toward me, clutching his fist and books to his chest. You smell just like my mom, he said softly. Her bracelet looks pretty on you too. I'm glad you like it. He left quickly and I locked the door, sat down at my desk and wept, resolving to make up to Teddy what I had deliberately deprived him of, a teacher who cares. I stayed every afternoon with Teddy from the end of Christmas holidays until the last day of school. Sometimes we worked together, sometimes he worked alone while I drew up lesson plans or graded papers. Slowly but surely, he caught up with the rest of the class. Gradually, there was a definite upswing curve in his grades. He did not have to repeat fifth grade. In fact, his final average was among the highest in the class. And although I knew he would be moving out of state when school was out, I was not worried for him. Terry, Teddy had reached a level that would stand him in good stead the following year, no matter where he went. He had enjoyed a measure of success, and as we were taught in our teacher training course, success builds success. my purpose or at least for it i'm searching ever since i was plucked from the stars into the earth's surface wrapped up my memory my That's objectives are really to have leaders who lead with belief and i call that social will they lead with beliefs and they believe that <clears throat> they believe in student success because they model high expectations for students with a position of understanding that they bring cultural assets. And cultural will is about cultural assets. And that they are intentionally, educators are, leaders are intentionally designing the system so that the infrastructure supports student success. And that's organizational will. And that they have the courage to actually act on behalf of student act on behalf of those beliefs and push policy forward. So over the um, many years that I've been in education, I've kind of designed a framework that fits for me. And this framework is what I call collective will. And it's the will that helps students be successful by looking at the social will, the cultural will, the organizational will, and then the political will. How do you explore equity consciousness using collective will? And then equity audits. We want to spend some time talking about how equity, equity audits can actually help you address what I call systemic issues. Because if we look at culturally responsive practices, it's about institutional racism, institutional pushback and we have to call it for what it is and design systems that address that and then introduce you to the equity audit process itself. So those are the three things that I want to spend some time with you on. So these are the questions to consider. So as you think about your school district, your organization and your work, what are those issues? What are the what what in your district would you point to and say there is collective will to actually address this issue, okay? And what's the evidence of that? We've been spending some time talking about evidence. So how do we feel about the fact that students aren't successful in our district? And I often quote at Ron Edmonds, which I did at the testimony, and Ron Edmonds says that we can wherever and whenever we choose, teach all students whose schooling is of interest to us. So I have to stop there because I wanna know why the students who are not being successful are not important to us. Because that's really the question. Why have we not designed our system to address those students whose schooling 
is important to us. So if everyone's important to us, why are we leaving kids out? What is the collective and individual responsibility to change the trajectory for students? This is not new, okay? We've been dealing with this issue of low student performance and achievement as long as I've been in education and before me. People like Jeannie Oaks inspired me. And then Jeannie Oaks says, I'm frustrated. I don't even want to deal with this anymore. I've been, I've been calling people on the carpet for years. I've been showing them the evidence for years. This goes back to a matter of heart. Yes, yes. At some point, it, it becomes, how am I going to change myself mm -hmm. to respond to people who are not like me, don't look like me, OK? <clears throat> and then how might uh, equity audits really assist school districts in understanding this whole concept of social, cultural, organizational, and uh, political will? So when I think about will, I've talked about those four areas, and uh, uh, the uh, um, Ron Edmonds is pictured up there, along with the Maasai tribe and organizational will, uh, I think about, you know, the, that, that structure that does not change. Um, and then a picture of uh, the students from Roosevelt, actually, who went to <laughs> testify with me. So as I think about um, these areas, it's all, to me, intentional. So social will is about beliefs. Do you really believe every child in your care can learn. And the data shows that teachers don't always believe that every child can learn. And so that's amazing to me. You're teaching a class of 20, 25, 30 students, but there are groups of students in your class you say, well, baby, you know, you're not gonna get it. You know, in your mind. You know, you're not maybe voicing that and can learn at high levels. So I think about my own personal experiences where I had counselors who told me, you will never amount to anything. I am not signing a letter of recommendation for you to go to college. You know, and so at some point you wanna send your degrees back to them and say, thank you. Thank you for encouraging me in a negative way, but encouraging me because I was gonna prove you wrong. And I have proved you wrong. But how many kids, kids actually sit in our classrooms and don't have anyone who believe in them? You know, and there are too many. There are too many of them. So I've already given you Ron Etman's um, kind of statement that I, I kind of live by. But then cultural will is about, it's about understanding the population of students that you're working with. So when I was superintendent, I used to ask the question, how are the children? How are the children? It's what the Maasai tribe ask each other as they pass daily. They ask, how are their children? Because they know that the children are their future. And it's, it's the future that they're looking for, that they're building upon. So how are the children? And the expected response in the district from my teachers and administrators was, and the children are well. And how do we know the children are well? How do we know the children are well? So that was the central question I would keep in front of them for the seven years I was superintendent up in Clover Park School District. So how are the children? So cultural will is about understanding the population. And you cannot understand the population of students if you don't understand your own culture, your, what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. You know, so when, when I used to have, uh, when I used to teach at UW, I would have students who would say to me, white students generally would say to me, but I don't have a culture. No, everyone has a culture. And so then we would go back and unpack that because everyone brings that to the table. So it's understanding the population because when you understand your students, in, uh, uh, like the, the uh, suggestion uh, in the letter, three, three um, letters from Teddy that I've read before um, and may read at the end of this, but, but that is really um, making sure that I'm in tune 
with the kids that come into my classroom. Each and every one of them are important. One of the things that we used to uh, say very frequently, and most of you as educators and parents and uh, no, we would say all kids can learn. And I had to erase that language of all in the district because I told the board, all blurs faces. When I look out and I'm speaking to a group and I say all, I can't see you as an individual because I've already said in my mind all, which blurred you as an individual. So the language had to change to every child, each child, so that I see you when I'm talking and see you in the, uh, in the lessons. So that's what cultural will is all about. Organizational will, um, sorry you're not able to see this that well, it's about building the infrastructure. So what are your hiring practices in the district? Are you intentionally putting people in front of students that look like them so that they have some sense of worth and achievement and future so organizational will is about allocating resources intentionally intentionally allocating resources um, i can give another example of organizational will when i was superintendent we used to have um, during the summer the buses when i first came to the district would not go and pick up the kids for our summer programs. And the budget person said, well, we just don't have the funds for do, to do that. I said, well, then how are we expected to get kids here? Well, their parents have to bring them. The parents with no cars, the parents who can't afford public transportation. So what happens to their kids? So no, that's going to change. We're going to have buses. You figure it out. I, you know, I was good for the ideas. This is it. You figure it out, that's what, your staff, you work it with me. You work it with me. If my children come to school and they haven't eaten, don't tell me that they can't have breakfast. You figure that out, okay? Because it's about you know uh, framing your organization so that it's uh, important. And <clears throat> the picture is, you know, I used to have a poster when I was principal that said it was not the mountain ahead of me that wears you out, it's the grain of sand in your shoe. And that's what I was trying to tell Karanja last night. Stay focused. Keep pictures of kids in your head and stay focused because you have a lot of grains of sand that are going to irritate you in your shoe. But the mountain can be accomplished. You will scale that mountain. You will reach the top of that mountain. And every kid is going to benefit from that. So don't give up. Don't give up. Political will. Political will is the most important piece of this. All of these interact together, so I can't say the most important because they are very equal to each other. But political will is about the courage to act at the local, the state, the national level and put policies and procedures and regulations in place. So the first thing I did as superintendent was to establish a policy on excellence and equity. And I figured my position as a superintendent was spent on a dime. All somebody had to do in the community, or a teacher, or anybody else, was get a hair up their toe. <laughs> and I would be gone, all right? Because that's what happens with superintendents. But if you put a policy in place, it will stay there, usually. I have to say usually nowadays because there's, there's an administration with executive order privileges that's kind of 
making you rethink that. But, but you know, the really reality is it makes people pay attention when you have it at the policy level. And so that's very important to have that policy in place. And so I was able to work with the board to develop that policy. When I came to OEIB, I asked the question about Oregon. I said, well, how are people vetting their materials? I mean, we need some kind of equity policy, you know, equity lens that they can look through. And so I was able to get the support from uh, the board to do that. Uh, Karanja is one of the most courageous people I have ever seen. You know, he, he will, he will. He, he knows, I've, I've said this to him on um, many occasions. So, so what happens then with these wills as they intersect with the equity audit process? Again, you know, Ryan Edmonds was really clear that we can teach students whose schooling is of interest to us. And so what is our capacity then to be able to do that? Um, again, in Clover Park, we had the uh, slogan that um, I wanted to keep in front of people every day, and our staff came up, we collaboratively came up with it. It was, believe it, they'll achieve it. And it sounds so simple, but it's right in front of people every day then. If you believe in these children, they will achieve. And so um, it wasn't just rhetoric. I used it as an opportunity to really model beliefs for students because this whole issue of equity starts at the leadership level. And the leadership has to model it. They have to put the uh, put um, these fr this framework in place, and they have to really believe that they can be successful. <laughs> so when we think about um, the equity audit process, we think about social will as really being like the heart of the work. You know, uh, I've often said to Charlene, she knows this. This work is hard work, but it's heart work. And that's the most important work is hard work. And then in understanding our, our students, um, the whole notion of how are the children, you know, we can successfully answer that when we know that every child is important to us. And sometimes I read the, the poem, You Don't Live on My Street. Um, and it's a very powerful powerful poem. Um, it, it really brings cultural will to the focus. It's about um, understanding that our kids come from all kinds of places. And as a result, how are we going to take that information and use it as part of the teaching process? So that's what the, um, and I'm, again, I'm not going to take time to read all of those, but cultural will I say hits you in the gut. You know, it's that poignant. Organizational will is about the, the infrastructure itself. So these are the questions I ask. What are your hiring pa patterns, for example? What are your practices around budget allocation? Where are your teachers assigned? Now that's really telling as a school leaders when you have all of your teachers who have um, advanced degrees, for example, and um, have been very successful in teaching, put with your students who are considered gifted or advanced. And I have to say considered gifted because kids are gifted. And, I, and that's a whole different lecture that I can talk to you about. But I don't believe in separating kids out by this, you know, I'm a gifted child syndrome. We all have gifts. Let's develop those gifts. So that, but like that, I said, that's a different lecture. What are your discipline practices? What does it look like when we have the majority of our African American boys always out of class, suspended? What does that say? Um, what are the special education patterns in your school and in your district? What are your practice for, practices for ELL? If you examine the concept of institutional racism, where would you say your system or your schools need to address this institutional racism? So organizational will really builds the appropriate and supportive infrastructures that help students to be successful. We, when we look at the equity, or, uh, equity 
audit process, we look for people like you. That's what this is about. Uh, Equity-oriented change agents, people who believe that this can happen, believe that it can be moved. <clears throat> and I'm not being um, sarcastic when I say the system has to change. The system, when we talk about blowing it up, you know, that may be dramatic in some ways, but um, too many of our students continue to fail. We already know that. We already know why, and it's built into the structure. The structure has to change. You know, it's pretty simple to me. But in, in responding to you, Matt, and to some of the things that you said, Kate and, and um, Sheila, this whole thing is about um, us being intentional, again, being really intentional. But intentionality starts at the leadership level. As a superintendent, that's why I loved being a superintendent so much, because I could craft and I, I'm saying this I, but I mean it in terms of a we, yes. because it's, it, it's the team that you put together. And I couldn't do anything in Clover Park without the team. Mm -hmm. But the leadership, mm -hmm. it's from the leadership level all the way throughout, it has to infuse all the way throughout the organization. So when I have people coming to me, as I had one teacher who said, why should we have all kids go to college? Who will make up the hotel beds? Oh, yes, right there in one of my meetings with teachers at, at one of my high schools. And, you know, those are, the, those are the belief systems that you're struggling against. At least she had the courage to say it. Don't get it twisted. She and I had a conversation about whether or not she was appropriate to be in the classroom, period, because our philosophies did not agree. And you're not going to be out there ruining uh -huh. my babies yes, uh -huh. you're not right. going to do that yes. okay mm -hmm. so but that has to be at the leadership level yes. those are the conversations i had to have with my board your board has to be brought along your community has to be brought along yes. Yes. you know that's what this is all about working yes. together mm -hmm. so when we talk about cultural will we're talking i used to have our our um our administrators were all reading the same books, you know, so that we can get a better understanding. Our city was reading the same yes. book yes. so we could get an understanding. My board was reading the same book, and I was training them on it. Mm -hmm. Now, books don't necessarily change art, mm -hmm. but they give you some really common good um, common language to have uh, conversations about and also the experiences of other people. So I did Tortilla Curtain, for example, mm. because a lot of people did not know about what uh, Mexican American, American folks are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so to have those conversations, but that starts at the leadership level. Mm -hmm. I had to say to them, this is, I didn't ask them, they didn't have choices mm -hmm. about cultural will, this is what you're gonna do. And so that sounds kind of dictatorial, and I don't intend for it to sound that way, but it was. Um, it was. But, you know, we ended up doing scrapbooks and cultural quilts that, you know, that, like, would hang in our uh, foyer so that every administrator had a patch of what their culture looks like and what that means. We had a scrapbook of student uh, experiences that would show what, social will is all about when you believe in me what I can really produce you know those are the things that are tangible that people that you leave with people so but cultural will is about understanding that population and you can't teach students that you don't know you can't teach them you cannot and I say that because on a surface level you may be giving them a knowledge base but for them to really understand and internalize, you have to know who they are. And they have to know who you are. And they have to know you care. They have to know you care. So that's what cultural will is all about. So when you connect cultural will, you will connect it to you don't live on my street. Okay? So organizational will, 
which is the third quadrant, so to speak, but they all interface. These are not independent of each other. Organizational will is about the infrastructure. What in the system needs to change in order for students to have the achievement trajectory that's going to make them successful? And some of those are hiring practices. Some of them are budget allocations. And some of them are looking at um, where teachers are placed in the system, which teachers are teaching gifted students, how are we placing special education students? Why are there so many African-American males in special education? Is that a kid problem or is that a system problem? Okay, and so you have to sit and let those things marinate with you. Okay, so organizational will is about that organizational structure and what needs to change. I have always maintained that we blame the kid. Education has been about fixing the kid, not fixing the system. And it is the system that's broken. When we talk about the issues in education and the issues around culturally responsive practices, we're talking about systemic issues. We're talking about a rot that goes to the core, a cancer that is infectious. It's a systemic issue. And in order to change the systemic issue, we have to have systematic practices that change the system. And that's about changing the mindset that we have in training teachers. And when I say teachers, I'm using a generic term because I mean educators. This does not happen absent administration. It does not happen absent parent involvement. It doesn't happen absent community involvement. This all has to work together for students to be successful. And then the last one is political will. And I think all of them are really important. But if we don't put the political will behind anything we do, it's not going to go anyplace. What I admire most about Karanja is that he doesn't sit he doesn't sit and wait for things to happen. He's been moving this work on teaching with purpose for many years now. When I first came to Oregon and came to his conference, there may have been 15, maybe 20 people there at the most. He said 10. I don't know, maybe the other five were his project managers. but. <laughs> <laughs> staff that he'd conjured up. But um, what he's done is so powerful because it's exploded. If you go to a Teaching with Purpose conference now, you have hundreds and hundreds of people interested in the work. Not only is he able to bring in top name researchers, I mean, where else are you going to go and hear Geneva Gay and Gloria Latson Billings and, and Tim Wise and some of the others that are really renowned in this field of culturally responsive practices. So I admire him. I admire him for his tenaciousness. I appreciate the fact that he's moving this forward. He's moving it forward. We sat there, we watched the legislature, uh, or the Senate committee actually, it was the Senate Education Committee. So what does that mean? All of you sitting in the room all of you sitting in the room and your constituents have to move this. We can't be quiet about this any longer because every day that we're silent, we have kids going unserved. And when we go home, if we can then respond to Ron Edmonds' statement and say, how do we feel about the fact that I didn't do anything? Now, if you can live with that, then you're better than I am. I will fly 2,000, 3,000, or whatever miles it takes to come and push the needle on equity. And that's what it's going to take in the state. When we talked about political will in, uh, in my district, for example, we put policy in place. So political will is about that policy level and the courage. And I knew that as superintendent, my position spun on a dime. You know, I said to some folks earlier, anybody in the community, a parent, a student can get a hair up their 
toe. And I would be gone as superintendent because that's the way it works. But when you have a policy, that stays. And people um, respond to the policy. The equity lens is now being vetted, uh, it's now being used through, uh, throughout Oregon in some way. Maybe not to the, the uh, degree we want it used yet, but it's a start. But I need you to keep pushing the work on equity. The equity lens has some belief statements in it that are very core to how you respond to culturally responsive practices. But we need you to move that forward. And I think the last thing that, that I want to just kind of talk about is all of this work that we're, we're talking has to have some teeth. So we can get a bill passed, we can get school districts certified in culturally responsive practices, we can have teachers certified in culturally responsive practices, but what does it look like as a district, as a system, to move it forward? And that's where equity audits come in. Equity audits are designed to look at the system, look at the system, provide the findings on equity, and then the recommendations for equity. So an equity audit begins from the premise, it's, uh, it's not going to be an audit that comes in to give you accolades. It's an exceptions audit, exceptions audit. Thin English um, has done audit work and it really established audit work very early in the 70s. And it was, it's very similar to what GAP standards are in accounting except they're GAP standards for education. And there are five standards, and I'm not gonna go through all of them here today unless you have questions on it. But one of the, one of the um, standards is called the connectivity standard, and that's the equity standard. How is the system connecting itself so that students can be successful and achieve? So in an equity audit, we look at three specific areas. We look at teacher quality, we look at program equity, and we look at achievement equity. So with, with teacher quality, we're looking, at, we're looking at what are those areas that teachers need to be involved in in order to move the system. So where are they placed in the system? How many years of experience do they have in the system? Are you moving them around uh, every year or every other year? Um, that's the uh, teacher quality piece. What does your system look like in terms of teacher quality and administratively, how are you placing them? And then program equity has to do with the various programs in the system. So it might be your bilingual education, your special education, and those programs that are uh, um, the ESL programs and, and so forth, but the program areas. Um, and then when we look at student achievement or the achievement equity, we're looking at the things like dropout um, data. We're looking at standardized test data. We're looking at college um, testing data. And then we pull all of that together in terms of findings and recommendations for how a school and or district moves forward. I'm gonna say to you in closing that equity starts at the leadership level and it's pervasive throughout the organization. I loved being a superintendent because I could craft, with the help of staff, the direction for the district. And that's what it's all about. It has to permeate throughout the system, and it starts with the leadership. This is good meat for us to eat, and I think, so while we, okay, so while we are eating our lunches. I mean, we need to really consider um, the content here because this is going to inform what we expect of uh, at the school. I was thinking especially the school level and the district level. Um, and as you're doing your audits, I, I, I had a question, we can maybe answer this later, but you know, you, the last slide was talking about equity, what was E-O-C-A? Yeah, so your equity agents and I, is there an ultimate expectation that across the system, like uh, every educator, every person, every bit of personnel becomes an equity agent? And I hope you guys got something out of this podcast. Again, this podcast is dedicated for everyone that is in that has has a passion 
that want to bring about change in education. We're activating equity in education. That's the purpose of this podcast. Again, this is the second episode, and it's having political will. Do we have political will in this in this climate? We are pushing a, a policy right now, excuse me, a law, a bill in Salem called Senate Bill 204. And this bill is a pilot project that will pretty much create a certification process that will require school districts, schools, and teachers to be culturally responsive certified. So we are going to be dealing with certain uh, domains within that framework of what that certification is going to look like. But we're right now, we want to continue, excuse me, we want to continue to talk about the importance of high expectations, which is belief. So as you heard throughout Dr. Doris' talk, she talked about the idea of belief. So everything starts with a belief. It starts with an expectation and it starts with a will to activate whatever you are believing to want to manifest and, ha- and make happen. So I want you guys to, to, to leave with this podcast, having a will, having an understanding of will and understanding this political climate at this time and how to activate education during this time and having that will to do that. So, again, welcome and we hope you guys continue to uh, tune in to the next episode, which is going to be episode three with special guest Tim Wise. Stay tuned.